Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Pointy Not Sharp. Today we're taking a look at the Austrian model of 1912 bayonet. Now this is an export bayonet made by OEWG for probably half of uh, South America. Now they're made to fit the model of 1912 uh, rifle, Mauser rifle, and essentially that's just an updated version of the Gewehr 98. And leading into the First World War, you could argue it was the most modern iteration of a Mauser rifle and probably the best rifle, arguably, in the um, First World War. Now, while they were made for South American contracts, um, OEWG had a large number of them that hadn't been delivered leading to the start of the war. So they were repurposed and put into Austrian use and they were redesignated Repeater Gewehr M14. Now the vast majority of these were made by OEWG uh, or Steyr, they changed their name from OEWG to Steyr in 1912. However, a very small number were made by Weisberg Kirschbaum from Zollingen, Germany. And in the 1930s, there was another iteration of this bayonet which was slightly different, made by Sig Neuhausen in um, Switzerland, and that was a Chilean contract. Now these were made for four countries. So Mexico ordered 100,000 of which 33,000 were delivered and the other 67,000 were retained by Austria during the First World War. Chile ordered 43,100 which were delivered. However, it's unclear if there was another order of 43,100 that was manufactured for Chile that was um, adopted by Austria or if that was a typo, it's really unclear. And uh, Columba, Columbia ordered 23,000, of which 5,000 were delivered, and the remainder stayed in Austria. There was also a very small order for China. However, it's not clear how many that um, China ordered and how many were delivered, but um, it's believed it wouldn't be more than a couple thousand, and there's really not much in the way of records out there for the, um, the Chinese order whatsoever. Now, jumping into the history of this bayonet, it's um, pretty interesting, I think. So OEWG, the manufacturer of the bayonet, was the biggest arms producer in the world at the time. They were producing for everyone. And they were in direct competition with DWM in Germany. And between the two companies, they had divided up the world, most of the world, uh, and said, you know, these are my customers, these are your customers, let's not poach each other's uh, fields. And uh, they'd done that pretty much everywhere except South America, which was still up for grabs. So there was a little bit of a race into South America where... They both started um, doing a lot of advertising and demonstrations, and um, in the end, it was uh, DWM that came out on top. And um, DWM were advertising this uh, fantastic new rifle they had, the uh, the model of 1912, best rifle ever, and uh, they secured a whole bunch of contracts for it before they realized they had made a critical mistake. They had overextended themselves because they had another large contract which meant they didn't have the facilities to produce a sufficient amount of rifles and bayonets. So they had to go crawling back to um, OEWG and contract OEWG to produce these bayonets and the rifles on their behalf. And that's why nearly all of them are made by OEWG. So as I previously stated, the four big contracts for these bayonets were Mexico, Chile, and uh, Colombia. However, at the start of uh, World War I, when war were declared, Austria retained a whole bunch of their undelivered uh, firearms and bayonets, and that included 67,000 from the Mexican contract, 43,100 from the Chilean contract, although that's not clear. Those could have been delivered to Chile and there might not have been 43,000 retained, or there could have been 43,000 additional that were manufactured and retained. It's unclear and still up for debate a little bit. And uh, Colombia, they retained 18,500 of their bayonets and rifles. So Austria retained a total of um, between 85,500 and 128,600. It's unclear the exact number that they retained, but it was a significant amount of rifles and um, bayonets. And they issued them to um, Alpine soldiers on the Alpine front where they were put to excellent use. And honestly, in my opinion, this is arguably the best bayonet of World War One, And I'll explain that and justify that when I get to construction. Now, interestingly enough, there was also a very small number of these used by uh, the UK during the First World War. So the UK were manufacturing warships for Chile, and um, that included them being completely outfitted with arms, equipment, everything, prior to them sailing down to Chile to be handed over. 
So 1,800 of the Model 1912 rifles and bayonets were stockpiled in these warships and then war were declared and uh, the UK, the same as, um, sorry, England, the same as Austria, retained those warships for their own service. And uh, those bayonets and rifles wound up in uh, Royal Navy service during the First World War. Now, there are a couple other iterations of this bayonet. So in the 1930s and possibly the 1960s, definitely the 1930s, there were a couple of updates to the bayonet for various countries. And uh, I think it's like the Model 1912 slash 30 or something like that. They're slightly longer, slightly different. Um, those are completely different bayonets. I'm going to cover them off in different videos. But for now, we'll jump into the construction. So this attached to a Gewehr 98 style of bayonet lug, which was pretty much the strongest bayonet lug system around. It didn't require a muzzle ring. So the fact that this had that system and a muzzle ring uh, means that the attachment to the rifle itself was incredibly strong and incredibly secure. Now, the reason I said this was, in my opinion, the best bayonet of the First World War is because it's a handy knife bayonet. It's something you can use utilitarianly. Uh, you can use it as a weapon in the trenches. It's not overly long like a, a P13 or a M, sorry, a Model 1917 or a Model 1905 or a Patton 1907. It's not ridiculous, ridiculously long. It's something small and handy that you can actually use. And on top of that, it's also got a large handle. So while there were other knife bayonets of the war, like the German SG-84-98, that was another great bayonet. Uh, that wasn't quite as sturdy as this one with the muzzle ring when attached to the rifle, though. And honestly, I prefer the grip on this one a little bit more. And obviously, the, uh, the Austrians were using the M95 bayonet with the inverted blade. Uh, that didn't have as strong of a locking mechanism uh, when fixing to the rifle. And it also had a significantly smaller handle, so it was much more difficult to um, get a good grip and, if you're in a fight, really wield it effectively. So the actual construction of the bayonet is very, very similar to the model of 1895 Mauser bayonet, which I've already done a video on. Key differences are the locking mechanism this is the Gewehr 98, whether that's the uh, the Gewehr 95 version, which has a high muzzle ring and doesn't have a strong locking, me locking mechanism down there. But easy way to tell them apart is uh, 1912 has a low muzzle ring and a high pommel, whether the 95 is the opposite, has a low pommel and a high muzzle ring. But the blade itself is identical, as far as I can tell. Taking a look at the blade, it's just a Mauser style of blade. Um, there's a million different variations of them. It's a fantastic style of blade, very effective, made of great steel. So it's got a flat spine, slight false edge unsharpened, true edge running down the full length of the blade, and rounded fullers either side of the blade. We've got a nice ricasso on either side where we um, ret retain all of our information. So we've got a manufacturer mark there. And then we have very small, very subtle cross guard. Doesn't need to be big, doesn't need to be heavy. Then moving down, we've got uh, two wooden grip panels. And originally these were retained by rivets. And uh, as you can see, this one is not. Now later in, I think it was Mexican service when they were refurbished and maybe Colombian as well, they were refurbished with uh, screws for the wood panels because that's what they had in service. And once you took the, um, the rivets out, you couldn't really reinstall them. Uh, this one here appears to have a nail through it, so I don't know what's going on with this. It's been um, refurbished very poorly somewhere. And they usually have a clearance hole up the top, like you have on most of your Mauser bayonets. So these are replacement grips. We have no clearance hole, and they've been attached by a pair of nails that have been ground off down here. Now our tang travels all the way down to the pole and terminates down about there. Really nice long pommel. This is a really light blade as well, considering it's, I really, really like it. And then we have a TO mortise down here. And that's where your long Gewehr 98 style of bayonet lug mounts. Now these mounted below the barrel as uh, most bayonets by the First World War did. And then we just have our press button. That just comes out the other side. Ugh, it's a bit stiff this one. And they've got a ramped lug, like pretty much all bayonets on the inside. So bayonet lug slides in, depresses the ramp, 
pushes it to the wall and then as it passes, it snaps into place. Moving down, very simple scabbard, exactly what you'd expect. It's just a steel scabbard, throat, got a egg shaped frog stud, not circular. I believe the circular ones were for a different bayonet. And the throat's retained by a rivet either side. Now this one is interesting. It has a little bit of a, I'll call it a dimple. And these are often seen on scabbards so that when you fit them to a rifle, you can fit it to the rifle with the scabbard on for training. Because um, otherwise the edge of the mouth there will um, not pass the barrel. So they've cut it down a tiny little bit. Other than that, nothing much to see. Got a ball for now. This one has been flattened. I believe they had drainage holes, but um, I can't tell from this one. This one now has a giant drainage hole. Now, finally, we'll jump into the markings. And there is a little bit of confusion around the markings. There's a couple that are quite simple and very well known. And there's also a couple that are less well known. So this one here, on the left Ricasso, I have my manufacturer, and that's uh, OEWG. Now, you can also find the manufacturer marking for Weisberg and Kirschbaum Zollingen there as well, as well as uh, Sig Neuhausen uh, for the later ones made in the 1930s. Um, those are the only places you'll find the manufacturer markings. Now, this one has nothing on the right Ricasso, and then it has a serial number down here on the base of the pommel. And this one is a little bit of a mystery because the placement of the serial number doesn't look correct for a Colombian bayonet. So when I purchased this one, I bought it from a deceased collector's estate. And uh, this collector was extremely knowledgeable. Uh, he knew 10 times what I know. And this one was labeled as Austrian retained manufactured for Mexico. So the Mexican ones on the right Ricasso would have RM for Republica Mexicana. And then they'd also have Republica Mexicana uh, printed on the cross guard as well. So we don't have that here. So maybe that was done when they were received in Mexico. Now for Chile, they will also have uh, the manufacturer on the left. They all have the manufacturer on the left. And then on the right, you'll have a Chilean crest. And then on the cross guard, you'll have your serial number. And the serial number will match a serial number on the top of the frog stud. This one does have a serial number on the top of the frog stud. And I don't, it doesn't match the one I've got down here on the pommel, so I don't know what's going on with that. And for the Colombian bayonets, uh, from what I've read, sometimes they were unmarked. Sometimes they had a serial number here on the base of the pommel, but sitting lower than this. And when they were refurbished, they had the low serial number with an F above or below it, but usually above. So that's how you spot a Colombian one. Now this one here has the uh, serial, number up, serial number up nice and high, and I've been told it's Austrian, but I can't confirm it. I don't know. Like it could be Colombian, it could be Mexican. I don't know. I've also been told the Mexican ones weren't always marked with the uh, Republica Mexicana. And the Chinese ones are a complete mystery box. I haven't seen any examples. We don't know what they look like or how they're marked. Um, there could be information out there somewhere that I'm just not privy to. Uh, if you know anything, comment below, guys. I'm sure we'd all love to hear from you. And the final part of the story of this bayonet is that um, after the war, a lot of them ended up in Yugoslavia. And I believe those were the ones that were retained by... Uh, Austria and um, over there the rifles were converted into the model 1924b rifle which I believe took its own bayonet which was just like a Yugoslavian version of the Belgian M1924 export bayonet so from there I don't know what happened to the 85 to 128,000 bayonets if they were destroyed sold or what happened but um they still pop up in the market pretty regularly. You come across the Chilean ones probably more than any other. Uh, you don't find the Mexican ones with the markings terribly often. And I have seen quite a few with the Colombian markings with the F. So I assume 
a large number of them survived based on the sheer number that I've seen. But this is the only one I've come across that only has a serial number and no F and no Mexican or Chilean markings. So I don't know. As I said, it was uh, labeled as Austrian retained, uh, manufactured for Mexico, but I can't confirm that. I can't ask the collector, he's passed away. Um, he kept, kept fantastic notes, but sadly, none about this, this one here. Anyway guys, if you made it to the end, thanks for watching. I've got uh, a ton more content coming and a lot, of, lot more really interesting stuff. So um, if you haven't already, I recommend you subscribe so you don't miss out. And thanks for watching.